What Keon just said is totally unbiblical. And it's going to be right in your price range. How many of y'all believe God can do it? Put a demand on God. Put a demand on him. Just put a demand on him. Like God, you said I was a lender. How are you going to help the poor if you're one of them? God needs some millionaires in the kingdom. So go out there, find out what you're supposed to put your hands to, and I want you to plow until your hands bleed. But let's talk about it here on All Things Theology. Cue my theme music. All Things Theology, All Things Theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hollow because this is how we do it at All Things Theology. Yo, grace and peace. Welcome back to an episode of All Things Theology, where this is your host, K-Dub. And today, we're going to talk about Keon Henderson. I have listened to quite a bit of sermons by this point, done a few video reviews as well. And I have never heard Keon Henderson uh, not preach about uh, you getting some kind of material blessing. Essentially put, all his money's about how you, God's going to bless you. Just keep doing the right thing. He's going to make you rich, wealthy, aka prosperity gospel, right? Well, I decided to listen to a Bible study of his thinking I would get a lot more sober preaching, that the preaching wouldn't be as, um, <laughs> how do I put it, uh, salacious and just hype and you know the, you know preachers do that ah, ah, that breathing thing every two seconds i thought i would like okay he's surely not going to do that in a bible study but i was wrong no, 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 no. hey but i decided to listen to myself this uh video is titled after these things the link will be in the description if you want to see for yourself some of the full context but we're going to look at a few sections so let's start with literally the intro let's go Dang it in the New English translation simultaneously because I want you to understand you're about to hear a whole lot of stuff that you don't know how to pronounce. And be honest with you. But let me actually go back because, again, remember, the sermon title was After These Things. None of actually what he read really mattered except the After These Things part. And he literally preached a sermon about literally those words and it literally had nothing to do with Ezra. And it didn't really have to do with any of the context. But again, after these things, God's going to bless you, right? I mean, that's really the point of why he read this verse. But uh, let's keep going. And be honest with you, I was in my study time. I was just going over it to make sure that I said it right. Because you have to understand that neither one of us in this room speak Hebrew. So whatever you're saying, you're probably saying it wrong. Because you're going to say it with an English vernacular. But the most important thing that I want you to see about this is whenever you see now after these things, it means that God did something after something happened. So here's the testimony for your life that no matter what's going on in it right now, one day you'll be able to stand up and say, after these things. Now, we're going to see the after these things he's trying to convey. But you think the historical narrative of Ezra was preached and <laughs> it had anything to do with Ezra because he jumped. He's he really going to jump over what after these things meant in Ezra day. And then it's like, well, after these things, you're going to get all these blessings. Right. Uh, but again, let's let's look at it. Uh, <laughs> man. That, that's. That's a you know word what, right if I there. could change the subject of the message right now, I would just change it. Yeah, change it. Change it online. Um, change it on YouTube. Change it on the placeholder. Change it everywhere. The name of this sermon is After These Things. Yeah. Y'all can sit down. That's all I'm going to say. I just got a whole different direction. After... Because the, the name of the sermon that I prepared for you today is called Supply and Demand. But the Word of God is a living, breathing mechanism. And as soon as I read it in your presence, the Lord told me to tell you. So God, middle of the sermon as he's reading it, told him to change his message and really to take a different direction during the sermon. So he's, he's really letting you know up front what he's about to say. He ain't really studied for these. God, God told him to change the title and the direction. 
Um, see, this is a problem of the charismatic, much of the charismatic movement. I don't want to broad brush and say everybody, but God speaks to them right during their sermon, even though he spoke to them to get the message, but he spoke to them during the message to change the message, which he spoke to them before. See, none of this actually makes sense. But these people are just cheering it along and just, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, Pastor. That's a word. That's It's a word, right? How do young folks say? It's a word. After this depression, after this dark season, do me a favor, touch three people and say, I'm going to survive this. I promise you. I promise you. I pro Sir, what have we told you about touching during the sermon? Get your hands off me! But again, you can see how it's not going to be. He's just saying now after these things and and um, funny enough, some versions just say now after this. Now, the point is something happened and then the Ezra seven is going on to tell you another historical event. So you would have to read back to chapter six to know what happened, to know what after this meant. But again, this is just telling you his, his historical what happened. But again, you know, a lot of these preachers like to do what's called perspectivalism. They'll take a historical historical narrative, right, and situate it to their modern day application or reality. It's not that the Bible can have modern day application, but it has to be fitting with the context of the passage. Right. But none of that matters with uh, Keon Henderson. Uh, so let's keep going. I promise you. I promise you. I count me out if you want to, but I promise you. I don't even know what I'm about to say right now. This is <laughs> Y'all got to pray for your boy. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? If a pastor ever says during his sermon, during his Bible study, that he does not know what he's about to say, you need to turn off the light. Out of my life. Out of my life. You need to get up out of there. I mean, that's that's literally not a good thing to say. You don't know what you're about to say. Again, it literally tells me you haven't studied. But remember, God told him to change the direction and the title. So I guess he wouldn't know what to say if, if that's the case. I mean, this is God breathe equivalent with scripture, apparently sermon, Bible study, right? Uh, I mean, I know people are going to defend that. Oh, well, maybe God did tell him. That. No, he didn't. Anyways, let's get to the next clip. Let me tell you something about the Bible. Y'all got time? Yeah. Let me tell you something about the Bible. Whenever you read a text, you have to be very, very careful to do the research to find out the context surrounding the text because any text taken out of context is a pretext. You now, this is actually very good what he's saying. The problem is the rest of this sermon and all of the sermons I've heard have violated this standard of what he's talking about. Because none of what he says uh, in the past sermons, remember the study study uh, sermon we looked at where he tried to make the person Benjamin, you know, the son, uh, be about Benjamin, like Benjamin Franklin, like money. That has nothing to do with the context. So that's a violation of that passage. So, you know, you can say the right thing, but actually by, uh, you know. Your confession actually violate the thing you say you believe. We're going to see more of that here in a second. I, I wanted to put that in there, but let's keep going. I don't know what God is saying if you don't know who he was saying it to. So when this scripture was read for the first time, it was a result of what Paul was writing because he was taking an offering from the church at Corinth. So he's, he's uh, gone to another passage by this point. So let's uh, hear what he has to say. And the reason why he was taking an offering is because Paul was in jail and he needed some money so he can get some Raymond noodles. I'm going to say it like we said at the house. He was trying to get some Roman noodles. Break it down, trying to get some money on his books. Try Paul wasn't actually asking for money for himself. I mean, because let's and, and it shows the ignorance of jail. In that day, I mean, it wasn't like there was a commissary in the Roman prison. <laughs> the only way you ate actually was if someone brought you food. Otherwise, you would die in jail. You know, so there was no commissary in the Roman jail. So I think that I believe the passage he's looking at is a uh, second Corinthians eight or, or nine, where Paul really expounds on uh, 
Christians giving. And he's not saying give to me. He's just saying give, just give, give freely, give to, to the church, right? Um, <laughs> it's nothing to do with Roman noodles. So it's very, it's very funny. The the standard of, hey, make sure you know who it's written to in the context is literally violated in the next breath. Get some flaming hots. <laughs> Trying to get some apple juice, trying to get, trying to get some cigarettes, whatever he was trying to get. Wait, what? No, 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 no. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Apostle Paul on a wreck trying to get some cigarettes. What? No. No. Come on, man. My goodness. He's trying to get his commissary, and, and he's trying to raise an offering, and he's bragging to everybody. Oh, the church of Corinth, oh, they so generous, they give. But y'all know that when it's time to really raise the offering, People start saying stuff like, ooh. They asking for what? I got five on it. Yeah, because Keon Henderson, he don't want your funky little five dollars, right? He he you you need to go go what what is, go big or go home, right? But that actually the what he's about to say, what he's saying already violates what, what the apostle Paul says, right? Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. So, yeah, that funky little five dollars you want, maybe that's all they can give. But remember, it's not to be reluctantly under compulsion. You know, like many of these false teachers love to love to put people under compulsion. We I, God told me to tell you somebody going to get five hundred dollars in here. Right. You always hear something like that. God wants a cheerful forgiver. We, there is no uh, exact amount you must give. Now, give cheerfully, give freely, be generous. I, I, I affirm that. But that's up to the person to decide, not Keon Henderson. I was bragging about how they give. And when it came time to give, everybody didn't want to do it the way he said do it. And watch what happens. That's <laughs> because y'all know that's not when it's happened. time to give, I'm going to say it. You know, the spirit is willing. <laughs> Come on, don't ever act like you be ready to give. But when it's time, you be like, woo. I don't know where he got like that's what was happening like Paul's like telling him to give but they weren't ready to give and then the spirit is willing flesh and wheat has had nothing to do with that that passage uh, uh, he's violated all sorts of rules of hermeneutics that he initially stated pastor say it's an uh, extra hundred dollars you got a hundred dollar faith but when it comes time to give it you got ten dollar action see you see what I mean that's exactly what I talked about like yeah yeah somebody got to give a hundred dollars somebody got to give a hundred dollars right no, give as you have decided in your heart. Now, for some, God may want them to give a hundred. Again, um, <laughs> now see, because five dollars won't. He he doesn't believe five dollars or that ten dollars is actually meaningful, right? He, he, he ten dollars. That spirit. That spirit. It'd be willing, but that flesh is weak. So when it came time to get that offering, it didn't tabulate to as much as they thought it was going to tabulate to. So Paul reminds them that God loves a cheerful giver. Now, what he's talking about never actually happened. He's making it seem like Paul said, hey, give. And then he kept, Paul started counting the money, you know, 10, 20, 30, $50, $50. That's all y'all going to give me. You know, that's th this controversy never actually happened. And so he's saying why God wrote God loves a cheerful giver is because they were short on some funds that, that that there's nowhere that is mentioned in this passage in in, in this uh, second Corinthians at all. I don't know where he's 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 reading something else into this passage. This is what we literally call eisegesis. And God says he loves a chill for giver because he doesn't want people to give under compulsion, not because of some some uh, offering controversy that he read into this passage. See, this is how you someone who's abusing a passage, but doing it boldly, cl claiming this is the pat context. And each one must give freely as a purpose in his heart. Exactly. So if you read the verse and you only think finances, you're going to miss God. Okay? You're going to miss God. You're going to miss God. T touch your name and say, don't miss God. <laughs> what God is doing here is he's laying down a principle that I believe is heaven's law of supply and demand. Now let me define supply and demand and then I'm going to teach you over the next few moments how to get in the vein of God's supply. 
Now, we're going to see how, though he doesn't believe it's all monetary, he does believe it is all material. So, yes, I mean, this computer here is not money itself, but it is a material possession which costs money. And so don't let the bait and switch get you. So now what he's about to teach is this supply and demand kind of like capitalistic. And again, I'm not anti-capitalistic, but this kind of capitalistic view of giving, um, which I'm not a capitalistic view of my giving. Right. I'm just fr I'm freely. But watch what he's going to get into. And really what much of the sermon is going to be. The supply and demand principle he just made up. It's actually not in the passage. I'm going to literally teach you today that when God decides to start blessing, I'm going to show you how to get in the way and get hit by accident. What? <laughs> I mean, Somebody yelled, hit me. <laughs> oh my goodness. How many of y'all, if, if y'all knew that God was getting ready to drop a blessing out of the sky right now, how many of y'all would be like, all the greedy people say yes. You ever, you ever see her <laughs> just looking for a fallen blessing, looking at I'm going to show you exactly how to get in the line of getting a blessing. Y'all want that? Now, here is the definition of supply and demand. The amount of a commodity, product, or service available and the desires of the buyers for it, considering all of the factors regulating the price. Now, what that means is, is that the more supply there is, the less there is demand for it. Okay, so for instance, a Toyota, they make them on assembly lines. So the reason why you can get one for 40, 50, 60, $70,000 is because they make so many of them that they can lower the price because nobody would pay exorbitant amounts for it because there's so much supply, there is no demand. Now, the I mean, yes. But you're going to see how this is about to actually turn into the narrative he's trying to spin. Yeah. So if there's a lot of supply, yeah, the demand isn't high. So therefore, the value is low. Right. Very simple. Uh, capitalistic. Eco right. Economy value lesson we're learning here. But let's keep going. Cyber truck. They could make it on the assembly line just like a Corolla, but they don't because they want to jack up the price because they know if that people, hear me, people are motivated by the fear of loss over the possibility of gain. FOMO. So if you feel like you're going to miss out, they know you will pay more for something that is not superior to that which you actually pay for. Now, this is exactly how they con people into giving. If you don't give, here's your time. God's telling me to telling you to give. And if you don't do it, the blessing's going to miss over and it's going to go to the next person down your road. You see, it, th this is exactly how they how they treat giving. This, I mean, this is the perfect analogy for it. <laughs> it's just critiquing his own position. A Rolls Royce ain't worth 500,000, except for the people who think it is. A Birkin bag, I hate to tell you, it is not worth 30 grand. There is not more leather in it than, say, a Louis Vuitton bag, but because there is scarcity. Then they come out and say, we got a Himalayan. It's a white crocodile, 330,000. Somebody goes out and pays for it. Why? Because there are not many of them. See, you're missing what I'm saying. You're yeah, thinking about purses. I'm talking about you. See, the way you increase your value is you stop acting like everybody else. You stop trying to be like everybody else. You stop trying to do what everybody else is doing and learn who God made you to be. And once you become what he made you to be, the demand goes up because the supply goes down. Slap somebody saying the next three years, I'm going to find out who I am so that I can increase the value on my own destiny. Sir, what are we told you about hitting people in church? Get your hands off me! So we're the product because if we find out who we really are, the supply goes up or the demand goes up. Even though there's one of me, it was the supply. I, again, this is, analogy is actually confusing. Who's demanding for us? And are we being bought? But what does that have to do with 2 Corinthians chapter 9? 
which is about giving. It, it, it literally makes no sense in light of the passage. And we're going to see a lot more of that. Like, remember the whole, you got to know the context, who is who. He, he's violated all of this with this supply and demand analogy he's trying to bring. Even if you wanted to kind of make some connection. But he's going to get worse. You always know it never gets better. It always gets worse. Watch this. You're the son of this, son of that person, son of this person, son of that person, son of this person. Uh, I think he might be back in Ezra 7. <laughs> so, yeah, I think he's back in Ezra 7. So he jumped out of uh, Ezra 7 to go to 2 Corinthians 9. Then he returns back because he's like, after these things, right? Son of that person, I'm getting ready to tell you the signal. This is how, you, this is how you're getting ready to get blessed. Listen up. It shows you, if you watch the Bible, that God loves to send his blessings through family lines. Oh man, you missed it. The truth is, some of y'all are way blessed, way more blessed than you want to admit. And see, when you try to really figure out what is this grace over my life, it's because God puts you right in line. See, that's why you better keep talking. I don't like my mom, I don't like my daddy. Your daddy might not have been there, but there was a blessing in his family line. Oh God, you better, I'm, Lord, don't y'all get loud because I'm about to shout up in here. Yeah, 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 he didn't raise you and he wasn't there for you and he didn't come to your cheerleading competition. He didn't come to your basketball game. He don't claim you. He didn't help you get to first house. He didn't buy your car. Yes, you missed all of that. But what you didn't know is that his great, great, great granddaddy had the anointing of God on him. And God let your mama meet that no good Negro to put you right in line of a blessing. What he's teaching is, is silly, biblically. What he's arguing is that the, the blessing comes through the family seed. And don't speak bad about your no good father because he just passed the blessing on to you. I mean, the Bible literally tells us that, the, I mean, the blessing comes not uh, by seed. It's not because of our physical lineage, but rather God's grace, his mercy. Uh, even even salvation comes that way. Right. Uh, John 1 13 um, he, or 12 and 13. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor to the will of man, nor to the will of flesh, but of God. I mean, so this is kind of some kind of caste system he's actually teaching, which is not Christianity. So guess what? If you're not guess what? If you're of the people who aren't blessed, you aren't you aren't born in the right family, then that means you're cursed. Right. And you can never escape that because there's no one in your family line who's blessed. You see how dangerous this is. But so much for context. I want everybody in here who don't know your daddy to start thanking God that God put you in the line. You focused on the wrong thing. You focused on basketball games and competitions and God says yes you missed out on all of that but what you didn't know is that there was a blessing that was for him that because he wasn't ready David I let it skip over him Solomon and the blessing is about to fall so the blessing skipped David and went to Solomon boy no, 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 no. in the right hands i'm looking for 117 people to lose your mind because god i'm convinced the fact that they're staying is proof they have lost their mind wait a minute who are you is about to put the blessing in your head Have somebody say these are blessed hands these are blessed hands these are blessed hands don't touch us sir with those oily hands but uh my goodness so the blessing comes through us now this next clip we're gonna see is actually gonna make this contradictory and actually more confusing not only does the blessing come to us by i guess being in the right family line um we're gonna see what the blessing is also Oh, you better hear what I'm telling you. And I'm getting ready to speak to you right now. Just because your daddy was one don't mean you got to become one. How many of y'all believe that God is about to use you to start a new 
Here is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God says, you are the new legacy in your family. And watch this. He says, I'm about to check. Listen, he says, I'm about to change your mentality. I want you to go from thinking about getting a blessing to realizing you are the blessing. Is this going to get funky in here? Because I'm going to use a bunch of adjectives. Um, how dare you? So we're not just getting the blessing. We are the blessing, <laughs> said no Bible verse ever. So much for Christ being the blessing, you know, salvation that he gives, you know, we receive it free. My goodness, man. And you got people that are just cheering this on. They, 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 I mean, where's the discernment in here in this church? God says, I'm about to put so much in you that I'm going to bless you, your mother, your children, and your children's children for a thousand generations if you believe that you are the next thing that God is about to use to break the curse on your family line. So we're, we're the thing. We're the thing to break the curse. Well, I, first of all, I don't hold to this whole idea of families being cursed like because of who they're born to. I mean, they're, they're cursed in Adam. I mean, let's get that straight. But there's no extra family curse you have, especially if you're in Christ. Um, but we're the curse breaker. Yeah, you won't find that idea in scripture. Um, but let's keep going. I title this clip Madness. <laughs> let's see what we got here. Ezra is in need of a blessing. And there is a king who does not believe in Ezra's God. But God tells the king who doesn't believe in him <laughs> to give Ezra everything he needs to get to the next city. Rewind that. Press play. Ezra needs supplies to get to the next place. He has nothing. But he is in the company of a king who has everything. The king who he is in the presence of does not believe in the God that Ezra believes in. He doesn't even pray to the God. But the God of Ezra tells the king, my guy is coming through. And make sure that when he gets there, you give him everything. Let me say it this way. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Here's what I am telling you. If you start walking in the direction that God has told you to walk, get ready for people to pop up that you did not expect to bless your vision even if they don't believe in your God. So what he's trying to argue is because we see this pagan king give to Ezra that's how it's going to be like you, for you, that you're going to be uh, just minding your business, obeying God. And then God's going to just send these pagan kings, you know, you're going to have Joe Biden, President Trump, all these kings who don't know God. And they're going to come in your life just to bless little old you. Right. He's saying this is Papa a deep. Right. This is not what the passage is about. This actually shows one thing that shows how God protects his his land, his his, uh, his people, his covenant. Right. By giving them what they need and not just. And again, the money wasn't actually for Ezra. If you actually read the passage, we're going to get to this in a second. It wasn't for Ezra. It was for the temple. <laughs> so this is this is the amazing thing about this. Ezra wasn't just balling out like counting 10, 50, 50, 40, 100, 3,000. He wasn't just stacking up the dough for himself. Remember, he's a priest. This all went to the temple. But you think he's going to read that part? No, right? I don't know who. And let me just say this. And even if it did just happen to Ezra, that doesn't mean because it happened to somebody in the Bible. Therefore, it is going to happen to you. I mean, is that is that a this is a failing basic logic. And remember, this violates his whole hermeneutic lesson he gave earlier. This word is for. But I need about 500 people to start thanking God that there was a blessing coming in your direction i hate when people do i hate when pastors do this i don't know who this is for well then why are you saying it <laughs> but i need about 500 people to 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 receive it of course you do from somebody you least expected for 
I can't hear y'all. I can't hear you. Watch this. Where did God tell Ezra to go to? He said, go to Jerusalem. The reason why he told him to go to Jerusalem is because the word Jerusalem in the Hebrew means he will see to it. I don't know who this word is for, but if you do what God tells you to do, he will see to it that the blessing finds you. I don't know who I'm talking to. Then hush. <laughs> but I'm not talking to people who are looking for the blessing. I'm talking about people who the blessing is looking for. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do a mind reset. Because all of your life you've been looking for the blessing. In the next five minutes, you're about to walk into a season where the blessing is going to come looking for you. And what if I told you that all miracles are voice activated? <laughs> and what if I told you this was dumb? No, 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 no. So you can see how the, the you know, the uh, all this is surrounding getting some kind of material wealth not only are we the not only will the bread in the pocket find us we are the bread in the pocket yes put the bread in the chat right you ain't just getting bread you are the bread yeah oh yeah this passage has literally nothing. We're going to refute this here in a second. I want to wait until he gets to this particular clip, but I titled this LOL. So what, let's see what's going to be so funny here. Give your neighbor a high five and say, here comes the blessing. Here comes the blessing. Come on, tell somebody, here comes the blessing. Everywhere your foot shall tread, God is going to give it to you. When you leave here and you wake up tomorrow, I want you to find a car that you can't afford and put your hand on it. I want you to- Sir, if you do that to my car, you go- Get your hands off me! Go, go, this man gonna have you get out of jail for slapping somebody's car. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, he, no what he's trying to say is, hey, I want you to claim that car as yours, right? This man gonna have you in debt. He gonna, this is bad. You know, he gave some financial advice earlier. This is bad financial advice. He gonna have a lot of people in debt. But you trying to claim a car, right? You trying to live with the the Hendersons, <laughs> with the Jones, right? Keep up with the Jones here and claim a car that you can't afford. How about you just pray for a, for a car that the Lord will provide for you? See, more covetousness being taught in the pulpit. Find a house you can't afford and walk in the neighborhood. Everywhere your foot shall tread, God is going to give it to you. If you believe it, make some noise. No, 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 no. Hold on. I want to hear that same energy with that house. Go and put your hand on that house. <laughs> go, go. Matter of fact, go and open that door of that house that ain't yours. Watch you see a man open that door saying, um, how dare you? Oh, yeah. See, this is just absurd teachings from the pulpit. Oh, man. Oh, but we got some more. We got some more. Right. Because, you know, Mike Todd isn't the only one going around saying we can put a demand on God. Keon thinks he can, too. What you gonna do when you finally find out who you are and you show up authentically like yourself and you go in ready to pay and Jesus has already paid it all. And <laughs> Jesus paying it all had nothing to do with finances. <laughs> I dare you to try to use that for, uh, for at the bank. I dare you to go up there for your happy meal saying Jesus paid it all. How dare you? That has nothing to do with your finances. This is, man, all, all of this is about money, man. You walk out because God has put somebody with authority in position. Here's what I speak over your life. From this day going forward, you will never pay the full price for anything. What? Nothing? Nothing? I mean, every, everything we're going to get a discount on. I mean, that sounds good. <laughs> sounds nice. I would love that to be a reality. But man, this is a prophecy he's giving to them. 
you know? Prophesy! He is literally saying, we are never going to. So, hey, look. You know what? Hey, hey, Keon, I, I accept that in the name of God. Shondo, hold on. I feel it in my spirit. So guess what, man? The next time, I, man, what, so what's going to happen when I go to wherever? Hey, rent coming up, man. Rent coming up. You know, mortgage coming down. Am I going to get a discount on all that? People go go buy a house for four hundred. It's going to be three hundred thousand. See, you're you're actually uh, making some kind of statement that you actually can't bake on, right? This is foolish. That is the second time in my life that somebody has sold a vehicle into my life. Oh, yeah. So he, he says this is going to happen essentially because somebody um, gave him a, 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 a vehicle. Therefore, we aren't going to pay full price. That's foolish. Ain't nothing like getting a title that you ain't have to pay for. Truth is, is as it is right now, some of you all have never seen a title. Because you got to get rid of it before you can pay it off. I speak a shift. You will see titles and deeds. <laughs> Look, you can go titles right now. You can see a title anytime you want. <laughs> you want to see a deed? Go to Indeed. Get a job, boy. And you will not pay full price. Right now, somebody lives in your house. Don't worry. They paying it down. Don't you worry. And just when you're ready for it, you're going to walk right in the door. And it's going to be right in your price range. How many of y'all believe God can do it? Put a demand on God. Put a demand on him. Put a demand on God. So we demand God. I mean, so much for letting our requests be known to God, right? Praying, asking, if it be His will, right? We we so so it's out. We we God, you need to go give me my house, give me my give me my car, right? You as as if we can demand God to do anything. A sovereign God cannot be demanded. I mean, this is the little God's kind of doctrine working out in in flesh, right? That they believe they can actually demand God to do anything. We ask God humbly. O oh Lord if it be thy will. If it be your will let us go. Isn't that what James tells us? If, if it, isn't this why we say. Uh, if the Lord wills. Right. Because we don't know. How can we demand anything from God. Let's put a demand on him. Like God. You said I was a lender. Oh, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I want to bring back the theology of God willing. You remember them old time saints used to say that? You remember that? You remember they used to say God willing? Oh, yeah, I want to bring back the theology of God willing. If God will, we will do this. I mean, that's what James tells us. Um, yeah, instead you ought to say, well, let me start verse at verse 13, chapter four. Come on. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a town and spend the yet year there and trade and make a profit. <laughs> like Keon Henderson, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mess that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, not we're going to put a demand on God to do it. If the Lord lives, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Um, amen to that, James. This is not a biblical the doctrine that he is bringing to the people. He's actually teaching them to sin against God. Yes, absolutely. Teaching people to demand anything from God is a sin. For everything God gives is a grace that we do not deserve. It is a gift. Gifts cannot be demanded. Only requested. Only freely given by the gift giver. Not the bar, so I want you Christians to stop feeling bad because you're blessed. Ain't nothing wrong with it. 
How are you going to help the poor if you're one of them? Now, see, this is actually the arrogant, arrogant thinking that teaches all Christians are to be rich. Now, Bible tells us to be content. Right. And the Apostle Paul helped many poor, though he himself was poor. I don't know what's this thinking that only rich people can give or only rich people can help people. Every poor person is should, in there should have been offended. Oh, so I can't really help anybody because I don't have as much money as you. This is actually insulting to poor people. Our value of helping people is determined by our how much we have in our bank account. See, he only views helping in regards of finances. But people need a lot more help than um, money. I mean, people counseling is huge in the church. But I doubt much of that is going on here. God needs some millionaires in the kingdom. And let me just say this. Saying God in need in the same sentence is not talking about the God of Scripture. For Scripture says, Acts 17, 25, God has no needs. So God doesn't need anybody. He don't need millionaires. He don't need nobody. God is sufficient in and of himself. He's ase. That is the doctrine of self-sufficiency. That's a denial of the self-sufficiency of God right there. So go out there. Find out what you're supposed to put your hands to. And I want you to plow until your hands bleed. Oh, so sad. And God is getting ready to send you unlikely partnerships. Mm. That's going to do the heavy lifting for you. And you're going to walk right into the next dimension. Because God is going to bless somebody to come in your life. That's going to send you to the next dimension. And need nothing in return. I'm fine in the reality I am now. I don't need to go in the in the the next dimension sir i've watched stranger things <laughs> i'm fine but uh yeah i told you we want to get back to this issue of uh ezra so to so this it's amazing it's, it's appreciated or you can give him everything you have and good po put god in a position where he can't resist you So we're irresistible. When somebody really loves you, they can't resist you. Not real love. He wants to be. And, and the Bible says, who can resist his will, not our will? Again, see, the roles have reversed. Man is starting to look like a lot like God in this uh, in this Bible study. And man, God's looking a lot like man. Wherever you are. And you don't even know he's got somebody lined up that has what you need. If you'll just get busy getting on the direction he told you to go. Listen, the Bible says that the king gave him 8,000 pounds of silver tabulated in today's money at this very moment that's 3.3 million dollars just for passing through he didn't do anything but just pass through not to mention the 600 bushels of wheat not to mention the 800 barrels of wine he gave him more than he could carry which means when you walk, you better be walking with some real help because what God is about to give you, you're going to need somebody to help you carry it. God put somebody in my life who loves me enough to want to see me succeed. How many of y'all pray to just put somebody in my life that just wants to see me win? What if it's somebody you don't expect it to come from? Yeah, so, you know, again, all of this is like 
it's supposed to be just for us, right? But notice what the text says in Ezra chapter 7. It says, with this money, then you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs. Huh. Those are sacrificial animals for the priest to use. Yes, yes. So it's a go-to service for the, uh, for the temple um, with their grain offerings and drink offerings. And you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. The money that was uh, to be used was primarily for the temple, not for Ezra to be bawling out and making it rain in, 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 in Israel, as he's kind of trying to imply like this is just for Israel for Ezra to put his hands on a new chariot and put his hand on a new a new house for himself that's not actually what's happening in the passage which violates his initial statements about context and knowing who it is and what it's about again missing the point missing it very badly but uh this 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 one is a prophecy he makes so let's hear this one he got to prophesy what you gonna do when you finally find out who you are and you show up authentically like yourself and you go in ready to pay and Jesus has already paid it all. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. <laughs> you know, I'm going to ball. Yeah, that's the remix. Yeah, that's the Keon Henderson hymn. Yeah, that ain't how it go. And you walk out because God has put somebody with authority in position. Here's what I speak over your life. Uh oh. From this day going forward, you will never pay the full price for anything. Never. Yeah, yeah, we ain't gonna pay nothing. We ain't gonna pay the full price. How many of y'all like that deal? It sounds good. <laughs> Just not biblical at all. Uh, one more clip, one more clip, and we'll bring this madness to a close. I feel something about to happen in here. Me too. I said, I feel something about to happen in here. Give your neighbor a high five and shout, neighbor, you walked in here broken, but God told me to tell you everything is going to be all right. Find you a praise partner because we about to tear the club up. <laughs> about to tear. See, yeah, I know that's how y'all view church. I know that's how y'all view no, it. No, no, no. That's how y'all view y'all church, though. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Reacting to their nastiness. You nasty. Yeah, y'all church is the club. I agree. Y'all, uh, yeah, tear that club up. Yeah, tear it up. Turn off the lights. Yeah, unfortunately, many many pastors do view their church as some kind of club or concert, some kind of secular entertainment event, rather than a place that the word of God is supposed to be properly pre preached. And not none of this nonsense we heard going on here. Find you somebody who looks like they believe what I'm talking about and tell them, neighbor, this is your season. That was last season. To not too. just have, but have more than enough. This is your season to walk in the favor of God. This is your season where you won't have to look for the blessing, but the blessing is coming to find you. Uh, I can't see nobody in here. I'm trying to find somebody who's serious. Find you a neighbor and shout, neighbor, oh, neighbor. God told me to tell you, weeping me endure for a night. But somebody shout, joy, it's coming in the morning. I don't know what tonight holds. But by the time you wake up tomorrow, there's going to be supply waiting on you. Let me tell you how to get it. The Bible says that King Azararis gave Ezra a letter. <laughs> King Ezra is King Arzara. <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, but we're going to wake up with the supply tomorrow. And it's Artaxerxes. Uh, we're gonna wait up, wait, wait, wake up tomorrow with a supply. So this, this, this whole thing, you know, the full, the, uh, the discount and all that's gonna happen tomorrow. Good news, everybody. <laughs> if you were short on that rent, short on that payment, Keon Henderson just told y'all tomorrow is gonna happen. 
And after he read the letter, he didn't tell anybody what it said. He just started praising God. And then the Lord told me that the way to get the supply is to praise God. Because praise puts a demand on God. So how you get the supply is you praise God. And then God is demanded. He's kind of put it. You put his arm in the back because you have praised him. You've you've you put some kind of obligation on God to actually grant some kind of monetary blessing in your life. You see how unbiblical this is? No, 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 no. The Bible never teaches any of what was just said. And it's 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 dangerous. It teaches the people to be greedy. And actually, the motivation for praise is to get something, not to actually praise God for who he is. This is Romans one type idolatry going on in this church. It's un very unfortunate, very unfortunate. But these people will scream, they'll holler. Uh, all they're hearing is this. I need cash now. Call J. G. Wentworth. Eight seven seven cash now. All they're hearing is how to get their their money and their pockets filled, and they're they're in love with it. Again, I'm not saying the gospel is be broke. I'm saying the gospel should bring contentment with what you have, whether we abase or abound. Anyways, Keon Henderson is to be avoided like the plague. Hope you enjoy this video. Till the next time, grace and peace. Yo, grace and peace. Thank you for watching another episode of All Things Theology. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go on and give me a like. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. I promise to give you weekly lives, videos, interactions, exposing false teachers, sharing with you, the viewer, my theological beliefs, things about the culture and the Bible. So if you're here for that, come on and join us. Also, if you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Links are in the description below. You can see content before it drops. You can also have Q&A sessions with also other Patreon members, YouTube members as well. So if you would like that, hit the description link in below.